So our first speaker is Annette Esper. She's one of our faculty, mainly based at uh, Grady, who is speaking to us about ARDS, this new and current definition. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm glad I get you all fresh in the morning. So I have nothing to disclose other than my research is funded by the NIH. So today I'm going to give you a brief overview of where we are today with ARDS, review the definition and, and the management to date, and then uh, briefly discuss the current state of ARDS and future directions. So what is ARDS? ARDS, just to review, is injury to the lung that results in alteration of the alveolar capillary membrane, uh, inflammatory infiltration of the lung, and accumulation of proteinaceous edema fluid. And there are multiple causes, as you can see here, of ARDS that we divide into direct and indirect causes. There are other causes that are not on this list. These are just the main causes. Um, and the most common cause is sepsis. So the definition has changed a little over time. Um, the first clinical description of ARDS, although it was described before then, was in 1967 and was published by Oshbaugh and colleagues. And then in 1994, uh, the uh, American European Consensus Conference came up with a definition that was widely agreed upon. And the definition included acute and onset after an at-risk diagnosis, bilateral infiltrates on chest x-ray, uh, severe hypoxemia, which is, was defined as a PF ratio less than or equal to 300, which was termed ALI, or acute lung injury, or a PF ratio less than or equal to 200, which was termed ARDS, and no left atrial hypertension, which was either no evidence of congestive heart failure or a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure less than or equal to 18. So some after, a few years after that, the, the AECC came up with some updated recommendations to help with strategies to design studies and to coordinate studies between centers for, for future study of ARDS. And what they recommended is that the collection of epidemiological data should be based on the 1994 AECC guidelines so that the, the patients that were recruited into these studies um, were similar, even, although it is a very heterogeneous disease. And when recruiting those patients, we should also collect information about prognosis and the etiology and other factors associated with uh, ARDS. So although the AECC definition was used for many, many years uh, for clinical diagnosis and for research studies, there were many problems with the AECC de definition. Um, first off, the setting. So an at-risk diagnosis is very important. Mark Moss and colleagues found that without this at-risk at -risk diagnosis, the positive predictive value of the AECC definition was very low. What about the oxygenation criteria? So while it's very um, important for the pathophysiology of ARDS, the oxygenation criteria is pretty arbitrary. Um, and we all know that there's various causes of, of hypoxemia other than ARDS. In addition, uh, patients with ARDS can concomitantly have a pulmonary, elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So this exclusion criteria was, was an issue with the older definition. And finally, when looking at a chest x-ray to determine whether someone had bilateral infiltrates, there was poor inter-observer reliability um, when trying to determine that. So the uh, European Society of Intensive Care Medicine um, put together a consensus conference to try to improve the definition. And so with that definition, they included three categories of hypoxemia. Um, they included four ancillary variables that they tested in about 4,000 patients in order to determine if these variables improved the prognostic power of the definition. And these four variables were radiographic severity, respiratory system compliance, PEEP, and corrected minute ventilation. When they evaluated these ancillary variables in these patients, they found that it really did not add to the prognostic uh, power of the definition. So these variables were left out of the final definition. Next, in the Berlin definition, they specified acuity. So they, the time frame was given that um, ARDS had developed within a week of an insult. And finally, in the defin final definition, they eliminated hydrostatic pressure and the term ALI. So this is a 2012 Berlin definition of ARDS, which defines ARDS as new or worsening respir respiratory failure within one week of a known insult with bilateral opacities that either are visualized on chest x-ray or uh, CAT scan, and severe hypoxemia, which was divided into mild, moderate, and severe. Now, the main updates with uh, this new definition are the timing, 
Um, the ability to determine whether someone had bilateral opacities either on chest x-ray or CAT scan, and finally, the minimum PEEP criteria. So by, by placing that minimum PEEP criteria, there was a minimum standard that all patients were on mechanical ventilation. So as far as prognosis, not surprisingly, 90-day mortality was increased as the severity of ARDS increased, and patients with more severe ARDS were on mechanical ventilation longer, so that's not surprising. With the new definition, when you compare the Berlin definition to the AECC definition, the Berlin definition was found to have slightly better prognostic, uh, you know, predictive validity for mortality, um, but not much better when you look at the area under the um, receiver operating curve. But this definition, although simpler and maybe perhaps clearer than the AECC, still had its own limitations. So we, when we look at the incidence of ARDS, we know that ARDS is a common syndrome. And there are, there's, this uh, graph here shows the incidence globally. Um, and you can see here that the incidence is variable. If you look at the red dots, or the red circles, uh, that depicts the incidence in the U.S. And you can see that over time, the incidence increased till, until about the year 2000, where it declined uh, dramatically, whether that it's because of variation in, in uh, the care that we gave those patients or in the design of those studies, it's, it's unclear. Um, and of note, you can see that the, U, the incidence in the U.S. is much higher than other countries. Um, and Europe as well, you can see in Europe the yellow circles, their incidence also increased, and the square depicts the incidence with the new Berlin definition. And you can see while in the U.S. the incidence has declined, in Europe the incidence has slightly increased. So what does this tell us? Well, ARDS is common. We know that. Um, and what it tells us is there's a lot of geographic variability in the incidence, and there's probably a lot of variation in how we enroll these patients into these studies. Now, we know that mortality for ARDS can vary between about 25 to 40 percent. Um, but the question is, how have we done over time? So this was a study that looked at um, cases from 1982 to 1998. It was a retrospective study and found that there was a trend in decreased mortality over time. Well, what about when we instituted um, interventions like low tidal volume ventilation and um, higher PEEP, for example? What has that done to ARDS mortality? Well, this was a retrospective study that looked at about 2,000 ARDS patients that were enrolled in ARDSNET trials to see if there was any change in mortality over time. And in this study, it showed that there was a trend in uh, decreased mortality in all the groups of patients with ARDS except the subgroup of patients that had trauma. So now I want to change over to management of ARDS. To date, there are no specific biological therapies for ARDS, so all we have is preventative and supportive care. I want to briefly touch on prevention of ARDS. I've listed here some factors or risk modifiers of ARDS that have been shown to put patients at increased risk for developing ARDS. What I want to briefly touch on is what I have listed here under multiple hits. So once a patient is admitted to the hospital, they are at risk for developing ARDS because of things that we may do to them in the hospital. So ventilator-induced lung injury, um, the administration of high levels, high FiO2, multiple transfusions, and fluid overload. All of these have been shown to uh, put someone at risk for developing ARDS. So to date, um, really the main intervention that we've had to, uh, for patients with ARDS is mechanical ventilation. That's the main intervention that's been shown to decrease mortality. And so this, the landmark ARMA, ARMA trial showed that low tidal volume ventilation and low airway pressure ventilation decreased mortality with an 11% absolute risk reduction in mortality in these patients. Um, Meta-analyses looking at randomized control trials of low tidal ventilation also found decreased mortality. And when you look at studies that showed the impact of adhering to low tidal volume, volume uh, ventilation, when there's poor adherence, there's increased mortality. So we know that low tidal volume ventilation is um, an important therapeutic um, option for these patients, and it is necessary. 
What about PEEP? There are a lot of studies that have looked at what is the optimal PEEP level in patients with, with ARDS. And although most of the studies did not show any significant difference between high or low PEEP levels in these patients, what they did find is that in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, so patients with a PF ratio of less than 150, higher PEEP levels did decrease mortality. So the next interventions I want to discuss are adjuncts to respiratory support, and they are supported by you know, one randomized control trial. And so I'm going to briefly discuss prone positioning, neuromuscular blockers, ECMO. And, and before I get to that, I just want to briefly mention steroids. There's always been a controversy about uh, using steroids in, in ARDS. Um, a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2006 indicated that giving patients uh, with ARDS for more than 14 days steroids is actually harmful. And there was a smaller study in CHEST in 2007 that showed that early administration of steroids within uh, 72 hours of ARDS onset may be beneficial. So currently there is no firm recommendation about whether or not um, you should use steroids for uh, ARDS. So to review uh, prone positioning briefly, prior to the Perceva study, there were a lot of, there were various smaller studies on prone positioning, and um, there were some negative studies and there were some positive studies. A lot of the positive studies were in, in surgical studies, in surgical patients. So the Perceva study was a randomized control trial in patients with severe ARDS, so a PF ratio of less than 150. And these patients were prone for 16 hours consecutively. And I want to emphasize that because the reason that this, the, the results of this study may vary from others is that prior studies did not prone patients for this long. So patients in this study were prone for 16 hours, and this study was done in a center with a lot of experience. Um, so what we found here is that there was a 28-day mortality reduction in the patients that were prone. And as you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier curve, 90-day mortality was decreased in the prone group. Um, so there was no difference in the adverse events between, between the two groups. So this is really a significant finding. And since this study, a, multi, um, a, a meta-analysis has shown that in patients with severe ARDS, prone positioning is be beneficial. So what about ECMO? A lot of the evidence um, pointing us towards ECMO has been case studies and really only one randomized control trial, which was the CSER trial. Um, it enrolled 180 patients, and it did find a six-month survival benefit for those that were in the ECMO group. Now, the issue with this study is that only 75% of those patients in the ECMO group actually received ECMO, and only 30% of patients in the control arm received low tidal volume ventilation. So at this time, there really is still a lot of research that needs to be done before um, the role of ECMO can really be defined in, in ARDS. Now, ECMO has become easier to, to utilize, but the, the is still unclear as far as what the best timing is and when to initiate it in these patients. Neuromuscular blocking agents in ARDS may be beneficial. This was the uh, randomized control trial that was done in 2010 in patients with severe ARDS, PF ratio of less than 150. Uh, patients were ra randomized to cisatropurium versus placebo for 48 hours. And the primary outcome here was 90-day hospital in-hospital mortality. Now, the crude, the 90-day crude uh, mortality, there was when you look at 90-day crude mortality, there was no significant difference between the two groups. But when adjusted, there was a benefit. The hazard ratio for death at 90 days in the treatment group was 0.68. So there was a benefit in the patients that received uh, neuromuscular blockers. Um, before we can actually make a firm recommendation about neuromuscular blocker use in ARDS, though, these these uh, data have to be replicated, but I think this study shows that, did show that it, it is safe and it can be utilized at this time if necessary in patients with severe ARDS. This slide shows us uh, that there were a lot of multiple studies that have been done on, uh, for other therapeutic agents that have not um, been positive. And part of that is potentially because of the limitation of the definition. We don't have a biomarker for ARDS. So we're limited when we enroll these patients by, by the current definition of, of ARDS. I just want to point out uh, briefly the FACT trial that showed there was no benefit um, between PAC or, or central venous catheter insertion for the management of ARDS. What I wanted to point out is although in this study, when they looked at um, conservative versus liberal fluid management in ARDS patients, although uh, 
although conservative fluid management did not show a mortality benefit, uh, it did get patients off the ventilator uh, more quickly. And this is just to highlight um, what is available for patients uh, aligned with the Berlin definition, what's available for management, and you can see as the severity increases, the intensity of intervention increases. The, the interventions in yellow are, are the interventions that still need um, uh, more data to support their use. So where are we now? Uh, where's the, what's the current state of ARDS since the new Berlin definition? The lung safe study uh, tried to address this, and it was an international perspective study of, in 50 ICUs that looked at over 29,000 patients undergoing mechanical ventilation. And what did the study find? Well, first off, as we mentioned earlier, ARDS is common. So they found ARDS in 10% of ICU admissions and 23% of uh, ventilated patients. More importantly, uh, it, ARDS is under-recognized. So 60% of ARDS cases were identified during the clinical course, and only 36% of those cases were at when the person initially met ARDS criteria. So we're not doing a great job of recognizing ARDS. How about the interventions that we use for these patients? The study found that the interventions are underutilized. This graph here shows the um, cumulative um, uh, tidal volume that patients received. And in this study, they found that 36% of ARDS patients did not receive low tidal volume ventilation. So 36% of patients were receiving more than 8, eight cc's per kg of, of tidal volume. Um, in addition, patients with were receiving low PEEP levels, even th those patients with severe ARDS. So higher PEEP strategy was not being utilized for these patients. And the use of other adjunctive treatments was low. So most commonly what was being used was neuromuscular blockers, high-dose steroids, and recruitment maneuvers to manage these patients. And finally, in this study, it showed that mortality, mortality remains high. And as we expect, with increasing severity, the mortality is going to increase. So although prior studies showed that mortality may be decreasing, the Lung Safe study, which was an international study, showed that mortality is still high, that we're not doing a great job of, of, of recognizing ARDS, and that it still continues to be a problem. So what is the future of ARDS? Well, the NHLBI put together an expert panel to figure out priorities for future research. Um, and so what, where we go from now is, um, the highest priority is for phase three trials for um, interventions and for prevention of ARDS, since we don't have a lot of interventions to use currently. So the Prevention and Early Treatment of Acute Lung Injury Clinical Trials Network was funded in 2014. It's funded for seven years, and it, has been, it is there to um, do studies for prevention of ARDS and for uh, early treatment of ARDS. And some of the studies that are upcoming are uh, reevaluating the use of neuromuscular blockers and ARDS. So there's a study um, looking at that again. Um, there may be studies looking at low tidal volume ventilation in patients at risk for ARDS, looking at vitamin D in ARDS, and even looking at no sedation in patients with ARDS. So a lot of new studies coming up with this, with this new network um, to advance uh, the, the literature on ARDS. So in conclusion... We see that um, AR the ARDS definition, the AECC and the Berlin definition really are not that different, although the Berlin definition is maybe a little bit simpler. We know that ARDS is common and the mortality remains high and low tidal volume ventilation is really the cornerstone of therapy. Um, and I think in general, we need to do a better job of, of recognizing ARDS and hopefully one of these days we can come up with a biomarker so that we can um, really advance the future studies looking at therapy for this disease. Any questions? <laughs>